All right, welcome to this lecture. Uh, I can see my breath. It's freaking cold. It's April and it's snowing out here. So anyway, um, we need to talk about a few really, really basic things. So let's get started. I'm just going to follow this PowerPoint that is what I've been developing to use in my classes for the past many years. But we're not having an in-person class and some, some of this stuff is in danger of falling by the wayside here. This is quite bad. It should not fall by any wayside. <coughs> so let's talk about single mean hypothesis tests with the T distribution because you'll see that the quizzes all talk about the T distribution. If you use JASP or any other software to do a T test of any kind, you will get a T statistic as a result. You won't get Z. But I've talked about Z for confidence intervals. The problem is that Z uh, assumes that we know population standard deviations, which we never really do. So let's, so far we know Z tests. If you've watched all those videos and internalized what they had, we know Z tests, we know, and for Z tests we know the population standard deviation. That's what sigma means. Sigma means a population value. These things are never accidental in mathematics. Now I'm a little sloppy sometimes, but mathematicians are not. I'm not a mathematician. Um, sigma means a population standard deviation. You can't just put your sample standard deviation in there and assume it's the same thing. <laughs> so that, that never really actually happens. Since we almost never know the population standard deviation, we have to use the sample standard deviation, just the thing that we calculate using the standard deviation formula from our data. We have to use the sample standard deviation as an estimate of the population standard deviation. However, Here's a basic principle of statistics. Statistics rewards knowledge and pun punishes ignorance. Statistics does not care about your feelings. The statistics, the statistics doesn't care if we had good intentions. If you get it wrong, you get it wrong. I mean, that's all it is. And if you don't know enough, then you get wrong answers. So the more you know, the better your answers are, which is weird and sad because what we're trying to do is find stuff out more than what we know which sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. So when we only know the, the sample standard deviation, then we can't just use that as an estimate of the population standard deviation. It's wrong. Um, to be more specific, if we were to sample from the population millions and millions, you know, an infinite number of times and calculate a standard deviation for each of those samples, the average of those standard deviations would not be the population standard deviation. The mean, on the other hand, is nice. It, you know, the average of all those millions of sample means would be the population mean. So we call the mean an unbiased estimate. The sample mean is an unbiased estimate of the population mean. We don't know that our mean is the same as the population mean. Then we try and get an idea of our confidence by doing a confidence interval. So we don't really know, but we do know that if we did this bazillions of times, the average of those bazillions of times, the mean would be the mean. So I keep saying the mean of the means is the mean. But you can't say that about the standard deviation. The standard deviation is off by a bit. The average of all those millions of standard deviations would be a little bit too small. So we have to adjust it a bit. So how does T relate to Z? T is what we do to adjust. We, we calculate a T statistic. Now, by the way, it's incredibly similar. It's so similar you could get confused and think you're calculating Z, but you're calculating T or vice versa. Um, a T statistic is the same thing as Z. It's just number of standard deviations away from the mean of a distribution, but you use a slightly different distribution. You use a different table in the back of your book. That's, that's what it boils down to for us. We use a different table to look up our values. So how, does, how do T and Z relate to each other? Um, they relate to each other in slightly different ways. So let's find the, uh, the area beyond Z, which we know the Z score that gives us 5% beyond that is 1.65, 5% on either side, uh, 1.645, whatever. So 1.65, let's see what the T statistic would be that would give us the same thing. So look at this picture here. The, the normal distribution, the Z distribution is in blue. And if you made a little line here at, yeah, let's see, you know, 1.645 ish, then right, right there, 1.645, you would find that under the blue distribution, you would find that the area of the curve that you found was um, 0.05. 
but under the t distribution in other words if you do, are if you if you just use the z score instead of the t score which you should use to adjust so if you didn't adjust for the fact that you don't know the population standard deviation this is how wrong you would be that area is 0.17 that's huge that's three times as big that's 17 percent instead of five percent it's over three times as big like three and a half times as big now this is one degree of freedom so there isn't just one t distribution there are millions there's an infinite number of t distributions because how wrong we are if we just use um, z to estimate population values how wrong we are depends on how much how big our sample size was bigger sample size we're not very wrong small sample size very wrong which makes sense right if you just have a few people from the population of course you're more likely to be wrong about what the entire population is doing uh, so the t formula it's not really a t formula anyway the way we use t it compensates for that one and degree of freedom means n minus one there's always a different degrees of freedom from here on out every statistic we use has a degrees of freedom that goes with it and it's always some n minus something it's always smaller than n so n minus one here is one that means there were two people in the sample so yeah that's horribly horribly wrong it's very different um, it's less wrong if you have three people in the sample so degrees of freedom is two sorry I keep doing that thing so 0.12 it's still almost three that was an accident line but it works um, we'd be wrong almost by a factor of three but not quite as bad um, three degrees of freedom so four people in our sample then we have 0.09 pretty much 0.10 if you round that off a bit so it's about twice as bad which is still pretty horrible that's 100 percent wrong if you look at it in a certain way so it's it's five percent plus an extra five percent it's pretty bad um four degrees of freedom now we're down to like nine percent so you can see as we get more and more degrees of freedom we're at nine degrees of freedom ten degrees of freedom when we get to ten degrees of freedom then we'd be wrong if we just used Z and said, oh, I found 5%. We would have actually been finding 6.5%, so that's not horrible. I mean, it's depending on your circumstances. It's not something we would ever accept as being okay because it could be pretty wrong, but it's not as bad as 10% or 12 or 17%. So if we keep going, now we have 20 degrees of freedom. 20 degrees of freedom, we're not bad. I mean, I mean, this could be a lot worse. 20 degrees of freedom, it's 0.06, 0.057. So uh, it's what, 14%? Or, yeah, I'm doing math wrong in my head. Do not listen to what I just said. That was probably wrong and stupid. I just realized that was a dumb way to think of it. So 25, 35, 40, 45, 50. So when we get up to 50 degrees of freedom, so an N of 51, which is kind of, at this point, N of 51, N of 50, they're pretty close to each other. 0 0.053 instead of 0 0.05. And look how close those curves are to each other. They're very, very close to each other. So the T distribution, there's a different T distribution for every degrees of freedom. The T distribution for 50 degrees of freedom is pretty close to the Z distribution. And as the sample size gets higher, it gets closer and closer. This is 0 0.05 and a half, 0 0.051. This is when you get to 250 degrees of freedom, it's the same down to two or three decimal places. So when we get to really high degrees of freedom, I mean, when you're at 200, 100, 150, things are pretty close. It's not really pretty that terrible, but, but it does matter. So we're gonna use degrees of freedom from now on and not just N. And so that's most of what we do with T. With T, we just put S instead of sigma into our, all of our formulas. You take the confidence interval formula, the Z-test formula, all that stuff. And instead of sigma, you plug an S in there and then instead of n, you put n minus one. Okay. Mm. Being sick kind of sucks. So, only a little bit right now, but still, it's kind of annoying. So, a thousand degrees of freedom. Wow, we're really, really, really close. <coughs> so it's just like z-tests, except you don't know sigma, so you use s instead. You just plug it into the formula. It's like where you would normally put population standard deviation the problem would say for some reason we happen to know that the population standard deviation now it won't say that so you calculate or the problem gives you the sample standard deviation you just put that in the same place in the formulas and then for the standard error of the mean 
where you usually put an n, an n, you put an n minus one instead. Except your textbook is weird. Your textbook is like just use n. It's simpler for the students. Okay, millions of students have figured out the n minus one. So unfortunately, now it's confusing, and we'll go back and forth. But it rarely makes any difference, any real difference that matters. <coughs> and finally, you look up your values like your 1.65, your 1.96, those values that give you areas under the curve, you look them up in a different table. You look them up at a table in the back of your book that is a t-table. It's areas of probability under the t-distributions. So they call it the t-distribution, although there's an infinite number of distributions. And the table has to be laid out a little differently. So the t-table is kind of annoying. It shows t-scores and percentiles, so areas under the curve. And it only does that for a certain number of different probabilities, only for the probabilities we care about. So the probabilities we care about for confidence intervals, for instance, and then the ones we care about for hypothesis tests. So each um, table only shows the critical t-score, so you're not going to find a t for a probability of 0.037, but you'll find it for 0.05, for 0.01, for 0.10, and then for halves of those. So 0.05, half of that, you'll find it for 0.025. And for 0.01, half of that is 0.005, so you'll find that there, because for Hypothesis tests, sometimes we're looking for just half, uh, just one tail at a time. So this is what the, ta the table looks like. So let's practice finding the critical T for certain things. So I'll pause for a minute. You can pause your video before I say anything. I'm going to pause for like five seconds in between each of these so you can pause. I really recommend you figure out how to do this because you'll have to do this for homework and tests. So alpha is 0.05. Alpha means the area in the tails and then two-tailed, that means that alpha, that 0.05, is divided into two pieces. 0.025 in one tail, so it's 0.025, and then another 0.025. So 0.025 on the positive side of the distribution and 0.025 on the negative. Notice that this looks like the normal distribution because it's incredibly similar. It's the same concept as a normal distribution, just slightly adjusted, that's all. So for n equals 18. So let's figure this out. And we're going to give the answer now. So alpha equals 0.05, um, and it's in two tails. So we're going to look on this. This table is laid, laid out a little weird, but it works. Uh, sorry, sorry, the two-tailed row. We're going to go over where it says two-tailed for 0.05. Now notice that's the same column as one tail, 0.025. So this is, this is the stuff we want right here and n equals 18, so that's 17 degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom is n minus 1 for a one sample hypothesis test like this, or a t-test with one sample. So we look in this column, and we go down to where it says 17, so that's 2.11. What? Can, can I control this? Control Z this mofo. Really? Let me, let me, can I just like erase everything? Yeah, thank you. Okay. So let's do another one. We're going to do a few of these. This video is going to be long because we're going to practice some stuff along the way. Again, alpha equals 0.05, but this time one-tailed. So the 0.05 is all in one tail of the distribution, and n equals 4. And what do we do here? We look in the one-tailed column for 0.05. That's the same as if it was 0.10 in two tails. So it's like you have 0.05 here, but then you also have 0.05 over here, right? So together, they would, if we only care about one side, but it's the same number here. It's a negative one here. Sorry, you have to, and you have to kind of adjust. There's a negative version of the number here and a positive version of the number here always. So this only gives you the positive versions, and if you need to know the negative one, you just have to kind of mentally go, oh, I'm going to add a minus sign in front of that. Okay, so a one-tailed test, um, one-tailed alpha 0.05, so 0.05 is all in one tail, so one tail 0.05, which is the same t value as if we had two tails with 0.10, because you'd, we'd have two of them, and we'd have double, double the area. And n equals 4, so 3 degrees of freedom, so it's this one right here, 2.35. I think so, alpha is 0.05, yeah, okay. Let's assume it's, that's correct. Next one, alpha equals 0.01, two-tailed, n equals 31. Let's see what that one is. So we're going to look on this two-tailed row here to find out 0 0.01, 0 0.010. Half of that is 0.005. So if we wanted to 
if so our two tailed test is going to give us 0 0.005 in each tail but all together it's 0 0.01 and either way that's going to give us the same number because it'll be plus and minus that number here so n equals 31 that's all the way at the bottom so 31 minus 1 is 30 so that's 2.75 so what this would be is a distribution like this I mean it looks like a normal distribution for hand drawing you'd have a positive 2.75 these are not raw scores these are not means these are T which is pretty much like Z and then over here you'd have negative 2.75 so it's 2.75 standard deviations below the mean, 2.75 standard deviations above the mean, and that gives you 0 0.005 in this tail and 0 0.005 in this tail right here too. So that's that's how that works. Um, yeah. So let we just that's weird. Okay, alpha equals 0 0.01 one tailed n equals 12. All right, so we look up here at the one tail, 0 0.01, which is 0 0.010, one tailed. So if we did that in two tails, it would give us 20%, or sorry, two, yeah, it would give us 2% instead of 1%. Sorry, that's 1%. We want 1%, but all in one tail. N equals 12, which is 11 degrees of freedom, 12 minus 1. So that's 2.72. That's our number. So we have a distribution, right, whatever, like this. It could be a, let's say it's a positive one-tailed thing that we want positive. Then we put 2.72 right here. That would be our T value. And that would give you 0 0.01 in there. Um, now, if you did the negative 2.72 on the other side, then you have another 0 0.01, and altogether alpha would be 0 0.02, which nobody ever really wants. We just, yeah, we don't do that. And then finally, oh, I'm gonna have to scribble this out because I'm lazy. Alpha equals 0 0.10, two-tailed, n equals 11. And I'll erase that while you think about it. All right, so it's two-tailed. Alpha equals 0 0.10, and n equals 11. Two-tailed here and let's look at 0 0.10, 0 0.10 right there. So it's going to be a big fat tail, it's 10% all in one tail. So this is what we would use for a 90% is it? No, it isn't what we'd use for a 90% confidence interval, we use 0 0.05 for that. Anyway we wouldn't use this for a confidence interval. All in one tail, n equals 11 so that's a sample, it's degrees of freedom is 10 so 1.81 and it's two-tailed, so we would use negative 1.81 and positive 1.81. The negative 1.81 would give us, you know, 10% here. Or sorry, oh, I'm wrong, no, go back, go back, go back. Erase, erase, undo. And I'm in the dome, so it can't connect to Wi-Fi in the house. Maybe I'll edit this out. So alpha equals 0.10 two-tailed. All right, so yes, we, this is the same as a confidence interval with a 95%. So this is like 0.95 in the middle, and then 0 0.10, or sorry, 0 0.0, oh, yeah, 0 0.05 here, and 0 0.05 here. So we need to know the positive and negative numbers to go there. It's not going to be one point something, by the way. Well, well, it might be. So n equals 11. All right, so we look at two-tailed, 0.10, which is the same as 0.05 in one tail. Now, if this was um, a z distribution, it would be 1.65 and minus 1.65, because that would be a 90% confidence interval, right? Sorry, that's 90 here, because 5 and 5 and 90. Yeah, I can add. No, I can't. Um, so here and n equals 11 which is 10 degrees of freedom is 1.81 so in the z distribution that would be 1.65 but we had to have a bigger one 1.81 anyway that's how you use that table i hope that is enough <coughs> so the standard error of the mean for a t distribution is exactly the same as previously it's a standard deviation divided by square root of n but it's the sample standard deviation the one you get from your sample still a standard deviation and you still divide it by the square root of n but 
most people out there say that mathematically you should do minus n minus 1. n minus 1, then take the square root of that. Your textbook just uses square root of n. If you make this mistake, this is not something I'm going to take points off for. I'm not sure what the mistake is. I mean, your textbook says it's right, even though it's wrong. But I think they just tried to simplify it. They just wanted students to have to learn one less thing. One less thing. Like, they wanted the, you to learn n minus 1 things. So anyway, um, how do you calculate t observed? The same way as z observed. For all hypothesis tests, there's always going to be this pattern. It's going to be a difference between the thing we are interested in. That's my little symbol for things I'm interested in, by the way. Minus... Um, some population estimate according to the null hypothesis, right? That's always going to be, it's going to be the difference between the point estimate of the thing you're interested in from your sample and what the null hypothesis says it should be. I don't use this symbolism, that's really dumb, I shouldn't have that. Um, it's going to be the thing in your sample, the sample estimate, and then what the null hypothesis says it should be in the population. It's always that difference and then you turn that difference into t-scores. I mean, you would normally turn it into z-scores, but we don't know the sample, the population standard deviation, so we turn it into z-scores, or sorry, into t-scores. <laughs> so you divide it by the standard error. And that's how you turn something into t-scores, or z-scores, or anything. It's, that's how you turn it into scores in the sampling distribution of the thing you're estimating. So in this case, um, what you're estimating is, the, is some population mean. Always a population mean. Sometimes defined in interesting ways, but it's always there. And hypothesis testing always assumes that we only test the null hypothesis, so we only put the null hypothesis mean into any of our calculations. The alternative hypothesis mean, we talk about it sometimes if we have an idea, but usually we don't even say the alternative hypothesis has a mean. We just say it's greater than or less than or either greater or less than the null hypothesis mean. We don't even specify it most of the time, which is a problem, but like I say, I'm teaching you how things work, not how they should work. So the point estimate of the true sample mean from the sample is the sample mean. So the difference between those two things is this. Sample mean minus the population mean according to the null hypothesis. Always sample minus population. It, just because that means if you get a negative value, then your sample was lower than the thing that's your benchmark, your null hypothesis. And if you get a positive value from this, from subtracting, then it was higher. Just the way we do a z-score. Basically, this is a z-score, but we call it t. And it's a z-score in, in a sampling distribution of means. And so there's a standard error, and it's the standard error of the mean. So it's the standard deviation of all possible sample means if the null hypothesis were true. And it's the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of run, 1. So we put those all together, and there's your formula. That is your t statistic. To be more clear, I'm going to be calling that, and most people, I think, like this, t o like sub-observed. So that's the observed t value. That is the t value that corresponds to your sample mean. You've got a sample mean. How do you turn that into a t value? You do that, and then you compare it to a critical t value that you get from the t table. And if it's on the right side, the correct side of that, then you reject the null hypothesis. Anyway, this is the mechanics of this are actually quite simple. And your book just kind of busts out the mechanics. It doesn't tell you anything about what's going on in the background, which I think is maybe a mistake. Um, we only use a z-test if we know the sample standard deviation, which we never really do. So we use t-tests all the time. So now, for the rest of this lecture, the rest of this lecture is just going to be three examples that I'll work through with you of how to do this. There'll be single sample t-tests, and then we'll do a confidence interval for using t for the sample mean after the t-test as well.